Just to give you a running start, the first five chapters, Paul, in writing this, this letter to the Romans there, he showed us the, uh, the sinfulness that we have as humanity and God's solution in Jesus Christ coming to die for our sins. The justification was laid out just as if I'd never sinned. He sees me innocent, declares me innocent, and sees me through the blood of Christ. In chapters 6 through 8, we begin to see that the grace that saved us is also changing us, and it's this great, great word called sanctification, which simply means set apart or made holy. And the important thing for us as believers now that we have been saved is to allow the Holy Spirit to lead and direct our life and not our fleshly desires. focus on God's plan for Israel. Remember, he is writing to Romans. They are there. There's many Jews there. And the reason you can say, well, why does he shift is because if you remember the last part of chapter 8, he says in a great, great way, nothing can separate us from the love of Christ. And the question that rings out, well, what about Israel? What about these people that God blessed and loved that are no, not seeing the Messiah? Are they gone off for good? Is God finished with them? Are they just a thing of the past? What's God's plan for them? And Paul lays out here in the next three chapters, chapter 9 is dealing with God's past work with Israel. Chapter 10 is dealing with God's present work with Israel. And chapter 11 dealing with the future work through Israel. But all three chapters, if you summed it up with just one phrase, it would be this. God is faithful. Amen. God is faithful to his plans and his promises. Just look at Israel. Here is a nation that has existed for thousands of years before they ever had a homeland, you might say. It's a nation that we look at today, you can pick up the papers or go on Facebook or watch the news or whatever. It's constantly in the news as a hotbed. The UN has voted against it. The nations surrounding it are all em enemies of Israel. You realize Israel, the homeland itself, is the size of New Jersey? And you think, man, that's a small area. Why is everybody getting bent out of shape? I believe it's because of the spiritual aspect. I believe so. I believe as we look at Israel and we see them surrounded by nations and we even see some believers against Israel, there is a God that is standing for them, our God, that will uphold them, that will carry them through and he has in his word declared a great plan for the nation of Israel. These are important for us to know. Why? Because in looking at God's plans, for his people, we understand his heart for us. We also understand the future that God has in store for the nation of Israel. It's good for us to be in support, I believe, of this people. They are chosen by God and blessed by the Lord. Look at chapter 1, or chapter 9, verse 1. Paul says, I, I tell the truth in Christ. I am not lying. My conscience also bearing witness in the Holy Spirit, that I have great sorrow and continual grief in my heart, for I could wish that I myself were accursed from Christ for my brethren, my countrymen, according to the flesh. Paul says, listen, no, my heart aches for you, Israel. I'm not off my rocker. I'm speaking the truth here. I'm led by the Spirit that deep inside my heart, I desperately want Israel to be saved. He even says there, I could wish that, uh, that I was accursed from Christ or if I could be cut off. Think about like a father. If you've ever had it as, as a father, an experience where your child is so sick that you're, in your heart you just ache for them saying, man, God, give me that illness. Give me that disease. Set them free. You know it's impossible, but that's the heart of love. And that's what Paul says. If I could just be somehow accursed from Christ, in, in, if it could happen, though it couldn't. And it was Moses who said the same thing about Israel in Exodus 32. Oh, they had come and they had worshiped this golden calf and they had made a great failure in their walk with God. And Moses found himself with the same heart, Exodus 32. 
says to the Lord, O oh, these people have committed a great sin and have made for themselves a, a God of gold. Yet now if you will forgive their sin, but if not, I pray, blot me out of your book which you have written. Speaking of the book of life. Why could Paul, Moses, you or I, not be accursed for another salvation? Because there was only one who was be, would be cursed for our salvation. You see, Galatians chapter 3, Paul writes and says, cursed is everyone who hangs from a tree. Right? And that was Jesus Christ himself. He's redeemed us from the curse of the law, having become a curse for us. That's why you can't be cut off Paul or Moses, because only Christ is the one who would be cut so that you and I could be saved. But then we look at this verse and we think, how in the world does one get such a heart for their loved ones or for their people, their family, that they would say, I would be willing to, in a sense, be cut off if they could be saved. I would be willing to take on whatever it took that they might be saved. And some of you have, have, have prayed that. Lord, save my relatives, whatever it takes. How did Paul, how did Moses have such a heart? Well, let me give it to you. I think there's two things. Number one is time with God. Time with God. You see, Moses went from you stiff-necked and stubborn people to, Lord, if you don't save them, if you don't rescue them, blot me out. How? 40 days on a mountain will do it. And in that time with God, what did he capture? He caught a vision first. He caught a vision of who God is in his glory, how God sees people that they're broken because of sin. I'm broken because of sin. And how necessary that is. And then we begin to have compassion. From vision to compassion, because I want to see my family saved, my people saved, know Jesus like I do. Time with God will do that. Secondly, prayer for others will do that. You see, Paul, in the very next chapter, writes in Romans 10, 1, Brethren, my heart's desire and prayer to God for Israel is that they may be saved. Remember, these are the very people that beat Paul. These are the very ones that time and time again continually disregarded his message. They were a thorn in his flesh. And yet here he's saying, I'd give up everything if they could just be saved. How do you have such a heart when people are throwing rocks at you, Paul? Prayer. Prayer changes your heart. It changes the, the situations and your time with God that all of a sudden you're saying, Lord, these people that have been against me, these issues that have confronted me, these challenges that I faced, Lord, I know that you still love these people. I want to love them too. Oh, that they could be saved. Time with God, prayer for others, great tools in God's heart surgery on ourself. But I think this is important that Paul would lay this out beforehand because they needed to know his heart of love for them because what he says next in the chapters following are very uh, hard things. From his heart for Israel to now his honor of Israel, he says in verse 4, who are the Israelites to whom pertain the adoption, the glory, the covenants, the giving of the law, the service of God, and the promises, of whom are the fathers and from whom according to the flesh Christ came, who is over all the eternally blessed God. Amen. He lists out nine privileges here that Israel had. Number one, they're called Israelites. It means governed by God. So God was their authority. Number two, we see adoption, that they were made part of his family. We see the glory, speaking of the cloud of fire that led them through the wilderness. There it came and ascended down, the very presence of God on Mount Sinai. And when they rebuilt the temple and built the temple, the glory of God came in. It's the kabod, the weight. What an experience. What a privilege they had with God. The giving of the law, it says there, the Torah, that God gave them through these first five books called the Pentateuch, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. He gave them moral laws to govern their heart. He gave them civil laws in order to treat each other kindly and rightly. He gave them judicial laws for what was needed to deal with sin and the consequences of it. He laid out these laws for them even sacrificial laws in worshiping God. And we look at the services of God, the next one, that is the temple services and the worship, how they could know their creator intimately, the promises of, of a land that they would inherit, 
of a legacy of faith that would be carried on, of ultimately the Lord, the Messiah that would come through them. What promises God has given these people are incredible. Of whom are the fathers, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, great men of God. And ultimately, he says, according to the flesh, Christ came. That's the culmination of all the privileges. The Messiah promised came fully human, Jewish DNA, he came. But he was more than just a man. As Paul says, he was the eternal, blessed, and sovereign God, the deity. If you have a highlighter and you're ever looking for a verse that gives you the proof that Jesus is God, highlight this one. You highlight it. Dig it in there. He is God manifested in the flesh. He is fully human, and yet he's the eternal, blessed God. No wonder there's an amen. We need to say it as well. But I think it's right for us as the church to have an honor and a respect for what God has done with the Jewish nation. I think it's right for us to value them and, and honor them. They're not perfect. They're not sinless, of course. But to realize that God has chosen this group of people and has blessed them tremendously with what we have just read, for through them came the Messiah, Jesus Christ. It's a good thing to have. They are not only given great privileges sovereignly by God, they are given a great position uh, by God as well. Look at verse 6. He says, but it's not that the word of God has taken no effect. In other words, he's not saying not all of Israel is missing it. There are some who have placed their faith in Jesus Christ, realizing he is the Messiah. Acts 21, verse 20 says there were thousands, even within the, the beginnings of the church, who placed their faith in Jesus Christ. But what he says there in verse 6 is that, for they are not all Israel who are of Israel, nor are they all children because they are the seed of Abraham, but in Isaac your seed shall be blessed or shall be called. That is, those who are of the children of flesh, these are not the children of God, but the children of promise are counted as the seed. For this is the word of promise. At this time I will come and Sarah shall have a son. Let me stop there for a moment. Because here we read that, that Paul says, listen, not everyone that is born into the family is gaining the spiritual inheritance. Not everyone who says, yes, I'm just an Israelite. I am privileged and I have an automatic golden ticket to, to heaven. He says, it doesn't work that way. The parallel is if we hear today, you know what, I'm a Christian because my mama was a Christian. She helped build this church. I'm a Christian because I got a Bible. Sits on the shelf. I'm a Christian because dot, dot, dot. Now listen, the Bible clearly says you must place your faith in Jesus Christ as a sacrifice for your sins in order to be saved. It's just the bottom line. Abraham, he says, points out, Paul, Abraham had two sons, Isaac and Ishmael. Both boys had the same father. Both had natural births, but only one had a spiritual promise. God chose Isaac by which the line would come through which the promises given to Abraham would come. And then he says in verse 10, and not only this, but when Rebekah also had conceived by one man, even by our father Isaac, for the children not yet being born, nor having done any good or evil, that the purpose of God according to election might stand, not of works, but of him who calls, it was said to her, the older shall serve the younger, as it is written, Jacob I have loved, but Esau I have hated. So Esau and Jacob, as a, as a contrast, were born to the same parents. Ishmael and Isaac could only claim Abraham as their father. But Esau and Jacob could say, listen, listen, it was, it was the same parents. In fact, we were born even at the same time. The one obviously was older than the other by minutes. But it, Paul's point is that God chose Jacob, the younger one, to inherit the greatest blessing. Whereas men would look at it and say, well, the firstborn needs the greatest blessing. God says, well, can't box me in. Watch this. And sovereignly, he says, listen, I'm going to choose the younger one of which the line would come, through which the promise to Abraham would come. God makes a distinction for his purpose. And here we see this little parentheses in, chapter, in uh, verse 11 where he talks about how God made his choice. Notice he says there, it was before they were born, 
that is the foreknowledge of God, that he sees our whole life at the same time, before any good or bad was done, that his choice wasn't based on birth order or affected by their works. It was simply God's sovereign choice for his purpose according to election that Jacob was elected to be the line through which God's promises would come. He says in verse 13, as it is written, this is out of Malachi chapter 1. This was thousands of years after Jacob and Esau, but he says this, Jacob was loved or favored and blessed, but Esau was hated, meaning loved less in comparison to the weighty favor shown to Jacob. You see, Esau got the material things. God blessed him with material things. God gave him a land, but Esau had no heart for the spiritual things by his own choice. And so the greater blessing fell upon Jacob that he would be the one to have those promises. And people have often said, I don't understand it. How could God say, I hate someone? I don't get it. Well, I'll tell you what's more amazing is how God could even love Jacob. Because Jacob was a scoundrel. Jacob was a, a prideful man. He was a liar. And it's amazing to think that God would even love him. Even you and I, we know ourselves naturally. And we stand in awe that God would even love us. Amen. Amen. Yeah. Sinner. <laughs> Sorry, bro. Just digging in there. We're all in that boat, right? God loves us. So what we learn about the sovereignty of God is that he is free to do what he wants. That's what Paul is saying. He's free to do what he wants. Now, for some people, this is incredibly disturbing news. God just does what he wants? You know, if I, if I can't figure it out, if it doesn't make sense, you know, what, what's happening and how he's working, and if I can't wrap my mind around it, then there must be some unfairness in it. Listen, understand, God never is unfair. I was reading this morning this verse that is repeated over and over and over throughout scriptures. Give thanks to the Lord for he is good for his mercy endures forever. You'll find that over and over throughout scriptures. We, we, we see God's mercy being shown. We see his goodness over and over. God cannot do sin. He can't do what's unfair. It's our minds that wrap around things that say, well, if there's a choice, then that must mean that, that he could do something wrong. But we're, and we're not understanding the whole picture. Some people have said, if I can't figure it out reasonably, then I won't believe it ultimately. And what happens is you have shrunk God down to your level. Your God is little. God is so much bigger. He's not accountable to us. He simply does what he does, but net, rest in this, that God, when he chooses, is not a random eeny, meeny, miny, mo. It's not picking and casting lots. He has a plan and a purpose in, in his work and what he does. And so for some, it may be disturbing, but for others, it's incredibly delighting to know that I don't have to have it all figured out. He chose me. He loves me. I believe in him. I know the end of the book. And so I can rest in that. But people have often struggled with this question, well, how do you know you're chosen? And I'll tell you, the answer is really simple. Have you believed in Jesus Christ for salvation? Yeah. Guess what? You're chosen. If you haven't believed in Jesus Christ for salvation, then why don't you believe in him and guess what? You find out you're chosen. It's like this, if I could illustrate it. Like a man walking by and looking over, and there at the entrance of heaven, he sees this sign above the gates of heaven. And the sign simply says, whosoever will, let him come. And the man decides, I am going to go to heaven. And he walks through that gate. And as he gets beyond the gate, he decides to look back. And above the gate, as he looked back, it says, you have been chosen since the foundation of the world. Hallelujah. Well, how did that happen? I thought I made the choice. Well, God knew what you would choose at the same time. So there's both in cooperation, working together. God has created us with this free will that we would love him freely and not forced. He respects man's choice. And yet as God, he knows everything. 
So he knows every choice a man would make and the repercussions of that choice and how it would spiderweb out. And so he can, at, this, at the same time, he can sovereignly choose to do something without violating man's free will. Your head hurt yet? <laughs> it's a tough thing to ultimately figure out. The point is this. When it comes to salvation, when it comes to God's plan, we can't throw out God's sovereignty and make it all about man's will and choosing, nor can we throw out man's responsibility and think we don't have any part in it to play at all. It's two sides of the same coin that give it the greatest value. They both have to be there. And that's what Paul is kind of laying out. In a mysterious way, they're both are there. But in chapter 9, Paul's focus is on the sovereignty of God. Why? Not so that his readers would get prideful or his readers would be, you know, captivated by fear. Paul writes these things because he wants them to know how faithful God is to them and how much he has blessed them and endured with them, though they're knuckleheads. We can see it in our own life. Thank you, Lord, that you're going to complete the work you've done in me because I am going to ruin it on my own. Just give me a day, and we're in the gutter. Well, you too. It happens. But God sovereignly gave Israel blessed privileges among all the nations of the earth, and he chose a spiritual line within the family of Israel as his own. But look at this. He also pardons and punishes. Verse 14. What shall we say then? Is there unrighteousness with God? Certainly not. For as he says to Moses, I will have mercy on whomever I will have mercy, and I will have compassion on whomever I will have compassion. So then it's not of him who wills, nor of him who runs, but of God who shows mercy. For the scripture says to Pharaoh, for this very purpose I have raised you up, that I may show my power in you, and that my name may be declared in all the earth. Therefore he has mercy on whom he wills, and whom he wills he hardens. Tough stuff. Paul says, listen, does God then, in his sovereign choice, somehow make him responsible for those who are not saved? No way. He has the right as God to show mercy and compassion as he pleases to whomever he wills. And this verse that he gives him in verse 15 comes from Exodus 33, Israel and the golden calf incident. I mean, if there ever was a time when God said, you guys have crossed the line, you guys are done with, I am over you, it would have been there. But God said, I'm going to have mercy on whomever I want to have mercy. I will show compassion however I want because I'm God. And he chose to pardon their sin. You see, mercy, again, is not getting what I deserve. God doesn't show you mercy because of you. He shows you mercy because that's his nature and who he is. So any mercy I received is not because I'm having a bad day or having a good day. It's simply the heart of God towards me always having a bad day, it seems. It's the mercy of God upon my life. I know what I deserve, and I thank God that he doesn't give me what I deserve. It's incredibly merciful. So Israel was pardoned, but in verse 17, we find that Pharaoh was punished. Pharaoh was put as the ruler of Egypt for, by God for a purpose, that God may show his power. You look at verse 17 again. For uh, the, this very purpose I have raised you up, that I may show my power in you, that my name may be declared in all the earth. The power of God was seen in Pharaoh, in the hardening of the heart. Now listen, Exodus chapter, um, uh, all over actually, at a bunch of times, nine times we find in the book of Exodus that God hardened Pharaoh's heart. Three times we find Pharaoh hardening his own heart, and five times it says without any indication, uh, it just that the heart was hard. But every instance has to do with a resistance against God. Every instance has to do with that. As Pharaoh hardened his heart against God's word and God's work and his miracles, God hardened him in that state and set him for destruction. Understand, this is not kind Pharaoh that was unwilling to do these things that God went, ha, 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 quack. This was a man whose heart was already set and bent towards these ways that God says, I will give you what you want. And that's what he saw, the hardness of his own heart, naturally. 
Verse 19, he says, clearly, you will say, then why does he still find fault? For who has resisted his will? I mean, if God's doing as he pleases, then why am I still charged as a sinner? Am I not simply determined or doing what he already determined? And that's just kind of a man's faulty reasoning there because look at what he says in verse 20. But indeed, O man, who are you to reply against God? Will the thing formed say to him who formed it, why have you made me like this? Does not the potter have the power over the clay from the same lump to make one vessel for honor and another for dishonor? And Paul uses this illustration with the potter and the clay in making whatever choices he chooses with the same lump of clay. He can get on that wheel and make this honorable dish that is prized or this valuable plate or whatever he wants to do, but he could also make things that are, in the text it says dishonorable, it simply means common. Hey, if he wants to make a garbage can or a spittoon, go for it, right? Who's going to say to the potter, what are you doing? Why are you doing that? The potter is doing what he wants to do. And this picture is this illustration that, that the potter, like God, is simply shaping things according to his will in his hands. Just as he took dirt at the beginning and made Adam, so now he is shaping lives He's shaping lives even with those same hands. And remember that those hands are scarred. Those hands went to the cross for you and I. That we can trust him. We can trust that those hands are not out there to crush me and, and kill me, but they're to shape me and mold me. I'm treasured in his eyes. He says, Jesse, you're a clay camper. <laughs> From the bunkhouse to the outhouse. It's all the work of God, you know? Hey, I'm the only one that can use that, unless you got clay in your name. Oh, more power to you. So I've thrown you on the wheel, and I've shaped you as I see fit. And as he lays these things out, we find that there's a sovereignty of God. But look at this verse here in 2 Timothy, the same writer, Paul. He then illustrates the responsibility of man. But in a great house, there are not only vessels of gold and silver, but also of wood and clay, some for honor and some for dishonor. Therefore, if anyone cleanses himself from the latter, he will be a vessel of honor, sanctified and useful for the master prepared for every good work. Oh, the reality is, is that God chooses, and yet we're still responsible. By faith in Christ, we can become a vessel of honor, useful to the master. Look at verse 22 back in Romans chapter 9. What if God, wanting to show his wrath and to make his power known, endured with much long suffering the vessels of wrath prepared for destruction, and that he might make known his riches of his glory on the vessels of mercy which he had prepared beforehand for glory, even us whom he called, not of the Jews only, but also of the Gentiles. In other words, if, if God patiently allowed people to go their own way according to their own sinful hearts, and then he judged righteously, can you and I charge him with being unfair? No. He's done everything to save men except force them to accept Christ, the solution for salvation. They have, in a sense, prepared their own heart for destruction without God's help. He says in verse 21, at the same time, if God chooses to show mercy on others and, and, and prepare them for this final day of glory, is he unfair as well in doing that? No. He's at liberty to do what he wants. And then he says in verse 24, if God chooses to have Jew and Gentile together in this thing called the blessed church, to come by faith into this thing, are we going to charge him with being unfair? No. No. And then he gives the scripture to back it up, verse 25. As he says also in Hosea, I will call them my people who were not my people, speaking of Gentiles, and her beloved who was not beloved. And it shall come to pass in the place where it was said to them, you are not my people, there they shall be called sons of the living God. Privileged, prized people as sons. They can come right in by faith as a part of the church. Verse 27, Isaiah also cries out concerning Israel, though the number of the children of Israel be as the sand of the sea, the remnant will be saved. For he will finish the work and cut it short in righteousness because the Lord will make a short work upon the earth. Basically, only a few of the nation of Israel would be saved, would come into this thing called the church. Not all of them would come, only a remnant would come into God's promises that he made. 
Remember, there were millions of people that came out of Egypt that had the title of Hebrews, right? How many made it into the promises? Two. Joshua and Caleb. God always has a remnant by which he will work through. As we're going to see, even as you read the rest of the Bible, there's a remnant that God works through that are saved. Even as we look through the, the tribulation and stuff in the book of Revelation, God has his way. Verse 29, and as Isaiah said before, unless the Lord of the Sabbath had left us a seed, we would have become like Sodom and we would have been made like Gomorrah. In other words, if God didn't show mercy, if he didn't do something, oh, we would have killed ourselves. We have been destroyed because of our sin. God sovereignly chose to do mercy. The privilege, the position, the pardon, and the punishment, it all shows us God's sovereignty and his work. He chose Israel and blessed Israel, and he sovereignly made a way for all men to be saved through Jesus Christ. Verse 30, as we close it out, we get to Paul's point here. He says, what shall we say then? The Gentiles who did not pursue righteousness have attained to righteousness, even the righteousness of faith. But Israel, pursuing the law of righteousness, has not attained to the law of righteousness. Why? Because they did not seek it by faith. But as it were written, by the works of the law, for they stumbled at that stumbling stone, as it is written, comes from Isaiah, Behold, I lay in Zion a stumbling stone and a rock of offense, and whoever believes in him will not be put to shame. Here's Paul's point. The Gentiles got what the Jewish nation missed. A righteousness in God's sight. The Gentiles weren't even looking for it. And God in his sovereignty says, I'm making it by faith available for you to come into the family. Whereas the Jewish nation was all about it, they were striving by all their works to be declared righteous and to prove that they were righteous in God's eyes and they missed it completely. It's quite a thing. You know the hardest people to reach for the gospel are the religious people? Amen. They're the ones who think they have it all together. Why? Why? Did God do this? Because righteousness is given by faith. It's not earned by your works. To work for it, he says there, listen, you're going to stumble. You're going to stumble over the simplicity of Christ. You're going to make it all about your works and your efforts so that you have something to boast in. And just like Paul writing to the Jews is just saying, listen, it's not about going to church. It's not all about how much you've given. It's not all about how good deeds you've done. All that does not prove yourself worthy of salvation. Jesus came and died for your sins so that by placing your faith in him, you would not only stumble, not stumble, you would not be put to shame. Salvation is found, not earned. Amen. And how important for us to remember that. Yes, it's important for us to do good works for the Lord, but that comes from salvation. I'm not trying to prove why God should save me. I'm already saved. I'm just simply responding because he's already saved me and I can't believe it. That's amazing. Lord, what can I do to serve you? What can I do to just reveal you and show your heart of love? There's so much grace in this relationship I have with you that, man, it's amazing, like Jacob, that you would even love me. But the Bible tells me that you've called me to yourself. You've, you've chosen me to yourself. I believe and place my faith in Jesus Christ. And as a result, he says, I'm faithful to finish the work that I've begun. Incredibly delighting. We're going to find here that, that God, uh, next, actually in a couple weeks, God's present view of Israel, he is still reaching out to his people. Yes, we can look in the past, we can see his sovereignty, that he wonderfully blessed this group of people with privileges and gifts. He graced them with a, a spiritual position. He even pardoned their sinfulness, showing them mercy while he was punishing Pharaoh. And this sovereign God laid out for Israel a plan to be saved, the opportunity. But most of Israel rejected it. But there were a few, a remnant, that believed and came into this beautiful thing called the church that God made, where Jews and Gentiles stand on the same ground by faith. Let's pray. Lord, we look...